Welcome to our seminar for the afternoon. It's my great pleasure to welcome everyone. My name is Michael Berry. I'm the director of the Center for Chinese Studies at UCLA. And we've had a action-packed quarter online. Uh, we recently hosted Zhang Ling, the notable contemporary Chinese-Canadian writer. We hosted Wu Hao, uh, director of 76 Days. But today is a special treat because we get to welcome one of our own faculty and celebrate his new publication, and also use this as an opportunity to celebrate his incredible contributions to the field of Chinese archaeology and intellectual history. And our speaker today is Lothar von Falkenhausen, and he has a new book, which is the center of this event today. However, we're not going to conduct it as a typical talk. It's going to be in a dialogue format. And so hopefully that will make things a little more dynamic and we're gonna have some extra voices brought to the table that we'll be introducing momentarily. Before we get started, I also wanna mention that today is part of a double feature, so to speak. And so immediately after this event, we will also have a lecture from Professor Duara from Duke University on China and the Asian world. And that you will need a separate code. You can go to the Center of Chinese Studies website to get the login code for that. That will begin at four o'clock Pacific Standard Time. And we hope many of you re-log in again to join us for that event. Uh, in, but for the time being, I, again, we're extremely excited to welcome our colleague, Professor von Falkenhausen. And in order to serve as master of ceremonies and introduce all of our speakers today, I'm going to bring up my colleague, Professor Min Lee, who is a uh, associate professor in the departments of Asian languages and cultures, as well as archaeology at UCLA. And he is going to be uh, introducing our speakers. So I'll turn it over to Min. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, it's a great honor to be part of this uh, activity to celebrate this uh, new book. First, I would like to introduce the uh, format of today's event. We will have uh, about 60 to 70 minutes dialogue between uh, the two uh, speakers. And then we will open the floor to the audience questions for about 20 to 30 minutes. So we will monitor the uh, uh, the chat room uh, to keep the questions. So it's, it will be a very long introduction if I cover all aspect of uh, uh, the speaker in this introductory remark. Uh, professor Van Falkenhausen is a distinguished professor of Chinese archeology span and art history at UCLA where he has taught since uh, 1993. And he was educated at Bonn University, Peking University Kyoto University and Harvard University where he got his PhD in anthropology from uh, in uh, 1988. So since I was a undergraduate student in Canada and when I, whenever I travel in China uh, visiting these archeological sites, people always uh, bring, ask me if I know Professor von Falkenhausen. So he's more like a legendary figure in, in the field of uh, uh, Sinology. So uh, his research uh, mainly focused on the archeology span Bronze Age China, on um, interdisciplinary and historical issues where archeological materials can provide new insight, which is reflected in his two major books, Suspended Music, Chime Bells in the Culture of Bronze Age China, and uh, the more recent award-winning Chinese Society in the Age of Confucius. Uh, which was seen from archeological perspective uh, that has been published in Japanese, Korean and Chinese translations. He has also um, the co-PI for the international team working on salt archeology span in middle Yangtze and currently the uh, international uh, archeological field school at Yangguanzhai in Shanxi. Uh, among many of his contributions, he's also the uh, president's uh, cultural property advisory committee member appointed by uh, President Obama. Just rotated and, off. Pardon? I just rotated off. Oh, okay. Sorry. Uh, and it, it, beside his teaching uh, contributions here and research uh, to uh, at Colson Institute of Archaeology, UCLA, uh, 
is also the Changjiang Chair Professor at Xibei University in Xi'an, where he's currently giving a, a lecture on economic archaeology of Bronze Age China. So he's also uh, served in the uh, Scientific Council in France, Germany, and also the Honorary Research Fellow of the Shanxi Archaeological Academy and the Honorary Professor of Zhejiang University. So uh, both uh, of our speakers today are the fellow of American Academy of Arts and Sciences and also Guggenheim uh, Fellowship. So Professor Sasi is the university professor from uh, um, University of Chicago, teaching in comparative literature, East Asian language and cultures, as well as the Committee on Social Thought. And he was a professor at UCLA in the 90s. Um, and he, his works try to bridge the lessons of classical and modern rhetoric to bring to bear on the several periods and language and discipline and cultures. Among his many works are the translation and citation uh, on Zhuang's Inside Out. And are we comparing yet? Very witty uh, subjects. And then we also have the great honor to have uh, Mr. Meng Fanzhi, the compiler and the editor of the book of these interviews that Professor Van Falkenhausen gave, mostly in Chinese, and also the books editors from the Sanjin Press in Shanxi, that's Mrs. Qin Yanlan, and the associate editor in chief, uh, Mr. Mo Xiaodong. So good morning and welcome everybody. So I will turn uh, to you two uh, to speak the dialogue. All right, all right. Thank you very much, Vimin. It was a very, very kind introduction. Uh, I'm glad you you pointed out that I'm a former UCLA colleague because in many ways I still miss that institution. It was it was a great place to be. Um, so Lotar, uh, reading this book of interviews is is like having a good long conversation with you about all kinds of things. It's really, you know, wu uh, bhutan, nothing, nothing excluded. Uh, and um, anyway, it's in a way, it's a compensation for not having been able to see you for, for quite a while. So I'm, I'm glad we're able to continue the, the conversation in the book with this other kind of conversation. I wanted to start out by asking you some questions, uh, or asking you to elaborate a little bit on some questions about uh, intellectual background in the largest sense, the kind of intellectual background that uh, goes back to kindergarten, if not before. Um, I, I had a chance when I was in Berlin year before last to meet quite a few members of your extended family. And I got a very strong impression that these are indeed Lothar's people. There, your your parents. I had a chance to know back in the past uh, for on many occasions when they came to to Los Angeles to visit, and that was always a delight. And I guess if I had to explain to people uh, what the Falkenhausen family is about, I'd say these are um, this is an educated milieu with a lot of freedom in it. Uh, my sense of your parents, and of course you would know better, but my sense is that they never said to you, don't study that subject, don't follow that avenue of research, don't become that kind of specialist out of any concern for, I don't know, what it is that, whatever, whatever it is that motivates parents, right? Questions about prestige or future income or family tradition. I have the sense that they were extremely encouraging and extremely free and also extremely stimulating. And I see this uh, in many members of your family where there are people who are lawyers, but also uh, cultural activists, uh, the art historians and so on and so forth. So the, the, the power to pursue your interest is a wonderful thing. I wonder um, if, this is my real question for you. All that was first elaboration. I wonder though, very subjectively, if that background, that, uh, that gift of freedom might have influenced the way you do your intellectual work. 
I see you as not a person who is in a discipline, but a person who is in between them, a person who orchestrates encounters among disciplines. Uh, archaeology, anthropology, art history, just to stick with the A's, right? And uh, your work ranges freely across relevant fields of knowledge. I'm, I'm wondering, what, how does this affect the way that you advise students, for example? Uh, do you ever tell people, uh, don't do this professionally uh, useful thing if it will limit you? What, what is your sense? Anyway, just to, to wrap up this whole question, what is your sense of sort of the, the, um, the, the, the nature of inquiry across disciplines and what kind of, of personality it develops in people? Thank you. That's a very rich question. And before I try to say something to it, I don't think I can really answer it, but I can sort of um, keep this conversation going. I would first like to say thank you to you all for being here. Uh, thank you in particular, Horn, for um, agreeing to join this. Uh, thank you, Lehman. And uh, thank you, Michael, for your introductory remarks. They are all much too flattering. And in fact, having a book with one's image on the title <laughs> published like this is, uh, is sort of an ambiguous experience. Um, if one were um, perhaps um, more naive than I am, one would come, um, uh, uh, come away possibly thinking that one is important, um, which uh, probably would be a mistake to think think in this particular case. Um, I would prefer to think of myself as somebody who um, enjoys what he is doing uh, very much. And of course, part of the enjoyment is being at UCLA and having this ast astonishing um, and, uh, and always challenging, but challenging in, in a good way, intellectual um, 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 terrain around oneself, uh, but, um, and as you pointed out, part of this is also, of course, having my family in the background, who, as you are quite, uh, as you quite rightly uh, su suspected, have, uh, have always been very supportive of, um, of what I do. In fact, when my grandfather was still alive at the time when I started learning Chinese, heard of that, the only thing he, uh, he said was, oh yes, you know, I was told when I was your age to learn Chinese and um, for various reasons didn't do it, but, um, but uh, nobody ever questioned that this is um, important. And, um, and of course, that's also one of the things that I tell my students that even though, you know, sometimes the material benefits aren't immediately obvious, um, the study of China um, and the chi study of China in its wider um, uh, connections um, across uh, the world and across the academic world is a, a thing that has great value in itself uh, because of the obvious importance of China. It wasn't maybe quite as, uh, as um, um, ubiquitously emphasized uh, when when I was starting out 40 years ago, more than 40 years ago. But um, nowadays, of course, you only need to open a newspaper and be reminded of you know how important China is. And one is also reminded, especially if one is a China scholar and reads this stuff, uh, how um, limited the flow of information still is, and how astonishingly ill-informed even sort of some of our our intellectual, not to speak of the political leaders, are about China. So this is something that something has to be done about. And so learning Chinese uh, is, um, in a sense, um, the, um, the first step into this universe, without which uh, it is impossible to, um, I think, to participate in a meaningful way in um, improving this information flow. But it is also, as I always point out to my students, uh, the um, insurance policy, because you know, should at the end the intellectual um, um, fascination with ancient China flag, or for various reasons, pr uh, professional opportunities in the field of ancient China studies not um, materialize. N knowing Chinese makes you employable. 
It, um, it is something that you can apply in all kinds of different fields and professions, mm -hmm. um, having to do with uh, what one might call the real world um, outside of academia. So uh, that is certainly something I uh, recommend to everybody whether or not they want to become uh, China-related academics, it is part of living meaningfully in the modern world. And in that sense, um, of course, um, it is what, what you and I are doing is very meaningful beyond the uh, very limited uh, perimeter in which we operate. I think it must be. But you know, in, in 1981, when you went off to uh, Peking University to- 79, actually. 79, I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, yeah, it, was, it wasn't so obvious at all at, at that moment, right? Uh, you would uh, read about China on page eight of the newspaper, and it would be a very small article that said something about Hua Guofeng and- About 10, every 10 days or so, yes. Right, right. So, so I think you were ahead of the trend, but also um, you were almost, um, uh, it, it may have seemed at the time you may have you, that you were steering yourself into a dead end because, of course, no foreigners could participate in archaeological digs in China. So, you know, this sounds a little bit like, uh, you know, the, a person uh, reporting to conduct a symphony with, uh, without hearing, let's say. You know, it's, it's a little bit paradoxical, but what, how did that feel for you at the time to be engaged in this thing that was outwardly not very promising, despite the intellectual interest? Yes, I mean, it, it was, again, it was something that obviously needed um, to be uh, explored because simply because it was there. Uh, Chinese archeology span is uh, certainly the part of archeology span the, the, the part of the archaeology of the what we call the high civilizations of the ancient world that had been at that point least um, explored uh, by um, the international academia and uh, the flow of important information was simply or, or new discoveries was simply overwhelming even then and of course it has become even more so since so um, it is true that certainly no dedicated academic jobs for this field existed in my home country in Germany, and I regret to say that this is still the case today, um, even though efforts have been announced and then withdrawn and may still come to fruition, hopefully, at some point. Um, but um, in any case, it, the importance is being realized increasingly now. And um, at the time, it was clear that this was a, an extremely promising field that um, was waiting for somebody to, um, to enter. And I thought this was very worthwhile. And it, it, is, it, was tr it was clear to me at the time that this was a risk. I had a plan B. I thought that, you know, if, um, uh, if, um, there were no way of pursuing this beyond a certain level, fine, I would become a German diplomat. Um, this idea I abandoned fairly quickly uh, after a while. A good thing. Yeah. Yes, I don't think it would have been the right thing. Um, but, uh, but at the time it seemed like certainly one of, and there, there were, would have been many other possibilities. Yeah. So, um, so, um, I, at the time, it was true, we were extremely frustrated about not being able to participate in field work. But on the other hand, there was certainly enough there to study. Simply, you know, taking the normal Peking University course load of classes on archaeology was um, enough to spend two years um, with. And um, since this kind of information really couldn't be absorbed um, anywhere in the Western world at the time, that was the place to go and do it. So I was very fortunate to have that opportunity, not only um, in, in the abstract, but also the opportunity of studying with uh, some of the truly leading intellectuals in the field of um, what I might call my parents' generation. Um, a couple of them are still alive, but most of them have since passed away, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, 
in any case, uh, that was in itself an extraordinary experience. And I think uh, that was not only true for me, but for everybody who had it at the time. Right. And repeat it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, and uh, I just wanted to advance to uh, one more step because uh, you were very fortunate in having a, a teacher and mentor uh, who was the reason for you coming over to this country, uh, Zhang Guangzhi known to generations of non-Chinese speakers as Casey Chang, mm -hmm. whose wonderful archaeology of ancient China, as, uh, you know, as old as it is, is still extremely valuable, I think. Uh, but let's talk a little bit about Zhang Guangzhi, to whom your first book is dedicated in very moving terms. Uh, I think you, uh, what do you, you have a, a wonderful quotation from the Li Ji. Right? Yeah. about about uh, a jade chime that gives out just the right amount of sound, not deafening and not too faint, but just right. Um, tell us a little bit about, about working with Zhang Guangzhi. Yes, well, that, that is, of course, a principle that I've tried to um, adopt in my own teaching myself, although whether or not I was as successful in that as Casey Zhang was, I don't know. But, you know, it, every student is different and especially that is especially true once you get them at the graduate level as doctoral students and um, to bring out uh, the uh, what is special to them and what they are particularly capable of doing takes um, a great deal of intuition mm -hmm. as well as um, I suppose pedagogical skills mm -hmm. um, neither yeah. of which Necess I necessarily have, but I've certainly tried very hard to uh, acquire them. And Casey Jung was a natural. Mm -hmm. He was um, extraordinary as a human being. I think that is even more important to realize. And this has, I'm not the only one who has emphasized this. Um, uh, when he passed away, in, uh, you can read this in, uh, in obituary after obituary. It, it is even more important than the, the impact that he had uh, on, on the scholarship in the field, which remains, as you say, very considerable mm -hmm. in more than one area, actually. It's not just uh, Chinese archaeology, by the way. He is also one of the guiding spirits behind the entire field of settlement archaeology, which came into uh, the fore just when he was beginning his career. Um, the um, uh, the, uh, the other thing that he uh, always um, um, promoted was doing archaeology in Taiwan, and he did two major field projects there, which, uh, which were um, uh, extraordinarily um, trailblazing mm -hmm. for the history of Taiwanese archaeology. So Chinese archaeology, mainland Chinese archaeology was only, you know, part of his purview. And of course, the, the archaeology of a, uh, ancient China, which summarized in one not very thick volume, the entire uh, sort of um, um, universe of um, early uh, Chinese archaeology, such as it presented itself um, at the time, under a, an anthropologically informed theoretical framework that was neither too rigid nor too loose, just right. That was a major intellectual achievement in the history of archaeology. Mm -hmm not just in the history of Chinese archaeology. I, I, I certainly so studying it. under somebody like that was a tremendous challenge, of course. But yeah. since he was so kind and accommodating, as I tried to allude in choosing this Li Ji quotation, it was also very enjoyable. Good, good. And also, I, I think of Zhang Guangzhi as one of those people who has multiple citizenship, disciplinarily speaking. Yes. Well, as an archaeologist, he was also an anthropologist, and he had yes. models for anthropology that served him very well in understanding the artifacts that are the, the brute givens of the archaeologist's life. So in that way, I see him as, as uh, having given a kind of pattern for things that you subsequently did. You know, it's not a, that's not a very great leap well, to make. 
he was much better at that. <laughs> he, he had a, a much better formation in the natural sciences. And um, this is now less known, but his original interest was in the Paleolithic, which is of course really the, the natural science part of archeology. span mm -hmm. so He was very strong in that. That's not, not, that's not something I've ever pursued at any, with, uh, at any detail. And, uh, and then of course he was also, he had also had um, something of a classical Chinese education. So he could handle um, the written sources effortlessly, right. uh, which of course I will never be able to do. I've never even tried. Although I'm, uh, of course, I feel responsible for them in some way, but, um, but uh, just bringing them in wherever they seem relevant without making too much of it. Mm -hmm. That was um, uh, that was a gift that he had, and uh, he was then uh, also able to still foreground the archaeological part of of the evidence. That is to say, that which was actually new and exciting, mm -hmm. um, and and just using uh, this the classical quotations as you know uh, uh, something of a base of reference. But which might be, in fact, put into a rather minor perspective by the archaeological finds. Mm -hmm. That's something our colleagues in China could still try to learn from Casey Chang. Uh, some of them, of course, um, do it very well. But uh, but in a general tendency in China has been traditionally to overemphasize these classical mm -hmm. textual connections, uh, and that has sometimes come to the detriment of bringing out what is really exciting about uh, the data from the field. Yeah. But in case Zijang, we have an example of somebody who's extremely tactful and flexible and imaginative, while yeah. very well grounded in fact. Are there, are there other influences you might mention, I mean, intellectual influences? I don't particularly mean people who were your teachers, but maybe you know books that stayed in your mind or other resources that uh, that are somehow always present in your thinking? Well, um, you know, of course, one could mention many things there, and some of them may be almost perhaps um, a subconscious. So uh, I'm not sure where to start. Um, <laughs> on the one hand, as I was often reminded, in fact, by Casey Zhang himself, it is extremely important to have a firm basis in one's own civilization mm. when one uh, studies another, uh, another civilization. So uh, having had that to some extent, not sufficiently perhaps, but at least um, to some extent, uh, by um, getting a reasonably okay again, not absolutely stellar, but reasonably okay, um, traditional education in Germany, uh, helped me to approach uh, the Chinese realities. Because if you come into that field without a basis of reference, a kind of you know, scale that you could apply at least sometimes in um, uh, 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 assessing what you experience there, then you very possibly might you find yourself um, floating around mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and um, disoriented. So that that has always been um, important, and um, it is probably less, less important which particular books I read in that respect. Um, uh, frankly, I wasn't very strongly influenced by any of the professors at, I had uh, at university in Germany. Um, and in fact, when I, when I went to China, I thought, you know, that part is over. I will no longer be influenced by any professors. Wrong I was. That's when it started. <laughs> but, um, uh, but, um, but of course, having that kind of self-confidence that one is at least willing to sort of explore on one's own and to, you know, if the professors don't work out, well, you know, figure it out oneself. Mm -hmm. That is also perhaps something important when one takes on uh, what is essentially, at least for one's own basis of reference, a new um, discipline uh, and tries to, um, uh, develop that within uh, one's own framework. Right. 
Right. Um, um, talking about archaeology and the uh, literary heritage uh, of China, there's something you said in a rather programmatic article back in 1993 that has often been quoted and I think often misunderstood. Mm. Right in that article, you're protesting against practices that make archaeology, as you say, the virtual handmaiden of antiquarianist historiography. And you make the charge that archaeologists have often failed to search for the kind of evidence that only archaeology can provide. Yes. And um, I think this is also a call to a certain model of interdisciplinarity, right? Uh, people tend to misunderstand this, I think, as saying, archaeologists should ignore the literary heritage, which would be the last thing that I would expect uh, you, Lothar, to, to say, but rather that the important thing is to keep them as separate voices that can cross cut and diverge. Yes, there is you have to be strong on both legs. Right. You can sort of subordinate the one thing to the other. And what I emphasize particularly in this context is that the study of the material record requires um, a special uh, set of methods that is different from the, once again, very special and well-defined set of methods that you need in philological research on ancient texts. And those two can meet at some point, but they can't be confounded from the very beginning. Because if you do that, you end up um, uh, studying one of those two bodies of uh, evidence, and it's usually the archaeological evidence, with the wrong methods. Yeah. And so, um, so that's what I emphasize all the time. I still, unfortunately, haven't felt the need to stop saying that, because it continues to be a problem. Mm, right. But in, in your uh, Chinese society in the age of Confucius, you, you often bring out textual evidence, but to contrast it with what we find evidenced by objects in the ground, right? And it, you also uh, call forth uh, hypotheses that people have emitted also on the basis of archeological evidence that are, as you say, refreshingly different from and far more detailed and more dynamic than the accounts in any of the transmitted texts. Uh, there are moments yes. like that that I think are very important where you're putting the two things into dialogue and not simply seeking confirmation of one by the other, which would be, again, that handmade situation that's bad for both disciplines, I think. It really is, and uh, and indeed that you you hit uh, the nail on the head here, in in, in particular in uh, in uh, the, um, the Chinese society in the age of Confucius book. Uh, that's of course what I tried to do. I didn't I try to say that the texts were wrong, uh, but um, I I was trying to say that uh, some of the things about which we have certain inklings from the texts uh, become much clearer when we apply our archaeological knowledge to them. Yeah. Of course, it also then turns out that the texts may not be as accurate as some people have thought, and they may only apply to a certain period and, you know, not to another period. Things become more complicated, but that's that's all for the better, in my opinion. Right. Well, the complexity sometimes yeah. comes in the form of periodization. There's a yeah. wonderful uh, explanation of why it is that Confucius is referring, when he talks about ritual order, to a situation which was not current in his day, but it, dates from several centuries previous. And that, yeah. of course, is, is the whole point of his making these, these uh, statements about how ritual works, right? Confucius is- Yes, uh, he probably would have never mentioned it otherwise, because it, was, it would have been evident to everybody. No. Rather than something that only very few people even remembered. Right. In his age. right. But here, periodization gives us an insight into the status of the discourse, right? Yeah. As in the status being, you know, is it fictional or non-fictional? Is it descriptive or normative? Is it uh, possibly even hortatory? <laughs> A text yes. that says, Absolutely. do this, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, if, you, if you can't get those linguistic modes straight, then your reading is going to be impossible. Right. But here, the evidence from the ground helps us understand which mode to apply. Yes, so I, I think and those moments are very precious. Yes, I agree with you. And of course, if I 
had wanted to write an 800 page book instead of a 400 page book, I could have put in all these texts and discussed them in detail. But um, that part, you know, has been done better by other scholars mm -hmm. who are truly on top of the textual material. So I didn't really want to dilute the archaeological part of the book uh, through more, even more textual references than I already provide. And I'm facing the same issue with the book that I'm currently writing, mm -hmm. where there certainly would be a great deal to say from a textual perspective, but it has actually been said and it has been well said by by other scholars, so I leave it to them. Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I mentioned interdisciplinarity. It's, uh, I guess, a particular obsession of mine uh, because I'm always trying to push people into doing it, uh, young and innocent people who's, who, who should know better than listen to me. Uh, but I think it's very important. You know, disciplines exist, I think, to be combined and to be made to say something other than what a discipline in isolation might say. But I wanted to focus a little bit on this because it's been a consistent theme in your work. In Suspended Music, for example, yes. the book that grew out of your dissertation, yes. you are, of course, occupied with archaeological objects, some very famous objects like the bells of Marquis Zung. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're also, as necessary, wandering into music theory, uh, metallurgy, acoustics, um, you know, social archaeology, as well as mm -hmm. uh, as the descriptive uh, earth-based archaeology, and so on. I find this very natural and sort of imposed by the kind of object you had in front of you, the kind of questions you wanted to ask about it. Uh, but that's just one case. Um, in in general, do you have an instinct for when it is that you need to leave the bounds of one? profession or discipline and go into another? Well, that depends, of course, on the evidence at hand. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and you know, what you just brought up harks back to a question you asked earlier, you know, wasn't I feeling constrained by the fact that I couldn't ex well, sure I was. On the other hand, I certainly couldn't have done all this work on bells uh, if I had had the opportunity to excavate. Mm -hmm. um, being essentially forced to come up with a topic that you could do based on the published archaeological reports and various parts of the literature led me to this, um, it, coming together with my already existing interest in music. And, um, and here too, Casey Zhang, you know, played an important role. He, he actually was quite musical and he, he was a great singer, but he didn't feel comfortable with, um, with music. And he said, okay, you know, we let Zhao Rulan, uh, who was then um, uh, teaching um, Chinese music at Harvard, we let, let her work uh, on, uh, join your committee and, uh, and deal with that aspect. But he never told me not to do it. Um, and of course, once I had done it, I mean, when I started, I wasn't so aware, but once I had done it, 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 came, it, it became clear that this really was extremely central, not just to, um, to understanding various musicological issues, but to understanding early Chinese culture, mm -hmm. and, and in particular, the scientific part of China, the intellectual um, uh, developments that led to uh, the development of um, proto-science and even modern science in China. So um, uh, it was uh, that uh, that it would be so important wasn't clear for, to me from the beginning. Mm -hmm. But uh, sometimes uh, these topics have their own dynamic. Mm -hmm. You start at one point and think you can probably, you know, confine it to uh, a more traditional archaeological approach, you know, to getting the typology right, uh, maybe, you know, incorporating certain tone measurements, and then it becomes clear, oh no, there's a great deal more and you have to talk about it. So, uh, and that's also something Casey Zhang always emphasized. Um, he always said, there's no excuse. You know, you can't run around saying you are an archaeologist, therefore I don't do X. You know, you can't uh, say you are an archaeologist archaeology and uh, an archaeologist and so you don't do texts or you right. don't do music or you don't do art. You can do a little less of it, but you have to consider it. You have to be tash, as he called it. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, th those are words to inscribe in gold over various pediments of institutions of learning where people are very dedicated to, uh, to departmental formations of knowledge. Maybe this is something to talk about a little bit, uh, right? Because, you know, scholarship is drawn to interdisciplinary questions. Yes. But how does, inter how does the interdisciplinary mode fit with institutions? How do you find a home for it in an institution? Well, of course, you know, we were very much encouraged to work interdisciplinarily when I was in graduate school, but the minute we have emerged on the job market, we were all punished for it. Exactly. Uh, because everybody said, oh, you are not a real X. This still happens to me today. And in fact, I was never able to uh, find employment in what I still re regard as my home discipline of anthropology. Um, the, when I arrived at UCLA, somebody suggested giving me a 0% courtesy appointment in the anthropology department. That was voted down because I wasn't a real archaeologist. I wouldn't even give you 0%. <laughs> I wouldn't give you 0%. But the, the art historians um, were extremely hospitable and, you know, um, could see the merit in what I was doing. And in fact, in, in some respects, I'm probably better served by this department than by what anthropology has since become. So I'm, I'm quite grateful to, uh, to have become an art history professor, even though, of course, I still um, emphasize the anthropological aspect of, arche uh, of archeology. span right. yeah. uh, And the historical ones. Mm -hmm. I deal with those, but yeah. but um, only as part of my curriculum. Right. Yeah, it is It is odd to see you uh, enrolled in a department of art history. I'm not going to protest, of course. It's it's good that you have that role. But, you know, the traditional appanage of, of art history is, uh, is quite different from the things that you bring to bear, I think, when you're interpreting objects. Well, I was always very interested in art history. I mean, in Western art history. Uh, when I was growing up. So, um, so there's, I certainly can talk to my colleagues on what they do. Right. That has never been a problem. Um, and, uh, and I'm interested in what they do as mm -hmm. well. And um, uh, then, of course, um, the, um, um, the um, anthropological methods are actually a boon to be able to apply to what some people might call works of art, because they bring out uh, dimensions in, uh, in their significance that mm -hmm. without these methods, you might not be able to find. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, when it comes to abstract sort of um, philosophical aesthetics, that's not my strength. Mm -hmm. I've I have some interest in that. I would like to be able to apply it to um, some of the early Chinese materials, but I'm probably not the best person to do that. Mm. Yeah. Um, you know, looking at your your the two major books that we've been talking about, Suspended Music and Chinese Society in the Age of Confucius, yeah. one would get the impression that you're a person who is mostly focusing on the upper stratum of society, right? The people who get buried in huge tombs full of wonderful bronzes and complete sets of bells and so on. Um, you, no one will ever complain about your uh, marvelous explanations of the people at that level of society. I, I find it very piquant and probably um, another source of, uh, of renewed investigation for you that when you finally go to China and begin getting your hands dirty in an actual excavation, it has to do with salt production yes. in, in the territories that are very far from the capitals and the grand palaces and tombs that had furnished those uh, early books of yours. So let's talk a little bit about salt archeology. span What do we learn from it? We learn a great deal about it. And in fact, the topic is, is closely related um, from the point of view of the intellectual processes that go on in its research uh, to the study of Chinese bells, because it also relates to um, uh, figuring out um, technical and technological processes um, over very long uh, space, uh, spans of time. And then it also relates to the, um, the exchange of um, 
moderately precious commodities uh, over large distances. Um, of course, this happens at a different social level, that's for sure. But, uh, but some of the anthropological issues involved here are actually surprisingly similar. And I've, I had always hoped to have the chance to uh, get to that, um, to, to get to that uh, social level, uh, because it isn't emphasized enough by um, our colleagues who do field work in China, who for various uh, understandable reasons, simply have to focus on elite um, remains that if they didn't excavate them right away would be um, you know threatened by uh, by grave robbers or by construction modern construction so um, understandably you know the the study of the non-elite so far has uh, taken the back seat in Chinese archaeology I think this is changing now um, uh, gradually and um, start uh, and the study of for instance um, resource extraction sites and um, uh, production sites workshops etc etc that's sort of the new frontier in the field um, and um, we um, launched this um, international project uh, for the study of salt archaeology in the Upper Yangtze uh, River Basin in the late 1990s with this idea in mind that we might sort of put into motion a, um, a, a process um, in this direction. Um, Salt archaeology in particular uh, lent itself to international cooperation because it hadn't been done in China and it had been done um, in many different uh, other parts of the world. Um, so we could bring in specialists from um, all kinds of other areas from the new world and from the old world to look at these Chinese sites newly discovered at the time and somewhat enigmatic to their discoverers and could say immediately oh yes this is what they did and this is how they did it and then the, our colleagues with whom we collaborated uh, listened to them and said aha uh -huh, um, are you really sure? So uh, we proceeded to show that, to in fact prove this by various methods. Mm -hmm. And so in the end, everybody was very happy. It's, it's really a poster child for a successful international collaboration. And the people who participated have all um, had very good careers in archaeology. One of them unfortunately died prematurely a few years ago. But, um, but in any case, um, that that is uh, that has been an extremely good experience. It, it publications from this project are still coming out. My colleague Li Shui Cheng at Peking University is just in the process of publishing a very major book on salt archaeology all over the world, which was majorly informed by our work there. Um, the the final report on our project is hopefully soon going to see the day. I think it was pub it was finished several years ago and has been sort of held up in publication, but it will now come out, I think, pretty soon. At least that's what I've, I'm being told. So um, I think the full impact hasn't even started to be felt yet. And yet, you know, once we started doing salt archaeology in the uh, suburbs of Chongqing, suddenly all over China, people started, you know, doing research on ancient salt production in Shandong on the coast, in Hong Kong even, also mm. on the coast, but also on inland sal salines in, uh, in Jiangxi province, which nobody had even known about before, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this, this has now become sort of a field that can stand of its own. And I'm very happy that um, that I sort of participated in its genesis and uh, at that very early stage brought in some people who could give advice as to how to do this kind of research. Because I myself, of course, wouldn't have known. This, mm -hmm. this is the kind of thing for which you need um, uh, specialists uh, who have the experience. Right. Um, yeah, one, one interesting thing about salt, right? It's, it's something that is very culture neutral it's very easily cross-cultural. People used it as money in ancient times. We, you know, we, basically salt has, dro has dropped below the horizon of our, our awareness because it's so cheap these days. But 
Once upon a time, salt was a precious commodity. And one of the things that you could reliably trade with people who are of another language and culture and so on than yourself, right? So yeah. I, I, can, I can well see how this would be a, a pivotal kind of investigation. Yeah. And that, that leads me to ask indiscreet questions about your present project, which you tell me is about the economic history of early China. What does salt, uh, what part does salt play in that? Well, that was, of course, the touchstone. I um, didn't, um, well, we, we actually did publish uh, three um, collective volumes about our field project, um, which have had a certain amount of, cons um, of, um, of circulation in China. Um, we published those in China, but in both languages, in English and Chinese, page, uh, page to page. A great deal of work uh, to compile, but I think worthwhile. But I, uh, except for one article, I never really published anything about the SALT project, mm -hmm. even though I thought I had a few things to say. I had sort of generate, I've been led, led towards generating a theoretical model for interregional exchange in early China. Mm -hmm. And in particular, for the, the kind of exchange that happened between what you might call the core area of the early Chinese kingdoms and their neighbors in the sort of more distant areas, including, of course, the Upper Yangtze Valley, where mm -hmm. we did our salt um, related work. And uh, this model involves sort of the, um, the, um, the coming into existence of long lasting, very stable sort of regular uh, patterns of economic ex exchange, um, annually repeated sort of missions of people going in both directions and uh, sort of exchanging their wares. Um, and, ever, and I must say, I came up with this in connection with uh, doing our work uh, in Zhongba at the salt producing site near Chongqing. Mm -hmm. But I've since found it um, in various guises elsewhere uh, as well, and, and in all different uh, um, geographical directions from the uh, so called core area. Um, the clearest example, probably the best example, isn't even our salt uh, um, uh, project, but uh, it would be the copper mines in the middle Yangtze Basin, uh, southern Hubei, uh, western Hunan, and, uh, and southern Anhui, where um, clearly copper was um, mined uh, mm -hmm. for centuries, uh, probably for millennia, by local people who were not um, under the political or even cultural sway of the early Chinese kingdoms, but who traded it or exchanged it in some fashion with them. And, um, uh, and then, of course, this copper became the um, raw material for some of the most magnificent bronzes ever produced in the history of the world. Mm -hmm. Not by the people who had mined the copper, needless to say, but by those counterparts of theirs who um, existed in the, um, in the contemporaneous kingdoms further to the north. And, um, and it's not totally clear what the local people got back in exchange. Mm -hmm. Apparently, they got some of the, the, uh, the finished products, which smacks of a sort of Leo colonial model. That's not what I'm going towards. I don't think that's, that's even the most important part of these exchanges. There are many things that remain unknown. But, but these kinds of inter, uh, interchanges, exchanges did happen along the borders of uh, the Chinese cultural core in a number of different areas involving various kinds of things that for various reasons, the um, inhabitants of the Shang and Zhou kingdoms weren't able to uh, get or produce on their own. Mm. You, you remind me of the great Zhuangzi story about the man from Qi who goes to sell ceremonial caps in Yue. Yes. And he finds that the men of Yue, they all shave their heads and they wear tattoos. So ceremonial caps are completely useless for them. I think your story about copper and salt puts that into perspective because 
the, the person coming to trade copper and salt never met, met with a refusal, right? They, these were things that were self-evidently useful and created the kind of tie that the protagonist of that little drama story is frustrated not to find. That's and true. In fact, that the, uh, that, that's a, a very astute observation. Um, uh, the, the, what we might call the products of higher culture, you know, the ritual objects, uh, once they get out, uh, they get taken out of their original contexts of cultural reference, become, if not meaningless, then at least they, they are strongly in need of being reinterpreted. Sometimes the reinterpretation succeeds, such as when, you know, ritual bronzes from the Shang and the Zhou got into the southern areas, copper producing areas, where they were used in a completely different way and also imitated by local um, bronze um, uh, makers who weren't quite as good as their counterparts further to the north, but okay. And uh, but but clearly we're, we're trying to do very different things. Mm -hmm. The same thing with the proto porcelain, or rather uh, we should probably call it a glazed stoneware from mm -hmm. uh, the Chinese Southeast, which was also traded to the north. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, in its original area, it is what ordinary people uh, use on a daily basis mm -hmm. in great numbers. Um, these were just, you know, ordinary rice bowls. By the time they get, got to the, the Shang court, they became, became precious uh, status symbols, <laughs> very rare mm -hmm. and, uh, and probably no less uh, valuable than, than some bronze vessels. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, exotic, which, which also in, enhances the value. Yeah, um, yeah. That's interesting to see, but of course, yeah. the same thing doesn't mean the same thing, um, depending on, uh, or, or no, no matter where it is. Mm. On the case, in the case of, you know, uh, commodities um, like salt and, uh, and copper, the kind of reinterpretation that goes on, if it is even necessary, will be a much more basic one. Right, right. But you're, so this, uh, this example of the copper trade and the salt trade remind us of how based in elite culture and values our frequent definitions of China are, or our accounts of the origin of China yes. or of the unity of China. I'm thinking of you know, uh, work that I admire a lot by Ge Zhao Guang and other people who talk about you know, culture, civilization, ritual order, moral order, uh, the writing system, you know, all of these things as being something that emanates from the center and achieves some kind of uptake all through the areas of China that uh, that know about them. But, you know, copper and salt has a very different dynamic. And maybe it was, maybe these were more important in binding together these different populations. Yeah, yes, and kind of long they, long the quest for those commodities may have initiated uh, the exchange systems that I was uh, talking about wow. without um, uh, without that um, the local populations might have just sort of uh, pers uh, pursued the production or the the um, extraction of these resources at a much uh, smaller scale just to satisfy their own needs mm, right but by being sort of drawn into a larger economic sphere of course, uh, new patterns of dependency and also new needs come into being. I mean, that's that's what economic archaeology is all about. Yeah. Um, it's not so much uh, economic history. I think the economic history of my period has been well studied uh, from the textual perspective mm -hmm. by some very eminent scholars, including, you know, Professor Richard von Glan of mm -hmm. uh, UCLA. So I'm not trying to compete with those. I'm just, uh, as in my previous book, I'm trying to adduce some supplementary materials that can help us um, see these already known um, developments in a new and in some cases slightly different or more detailed uh, perspective mm. and more representative in some ways, uh, but certainly um, incomplete necessarily, just as incomplete as the written record. But right. when you then put both of them together, maybe you can get somewhere. Right. Yeah, I, I see this as, as again, the, the shadow of anthropology Yes, uh, because anthropology is what teaches you to elicit implicit rules from behavior or from artifacts, and that's yeah. you know, more or less what I see you as doing.
rather than say writing, as you say, the economic history, but it's more uh, reconstructing patterns of economic behavior. Yes, well, I, uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable. Um, I mean, for that, you would also have to know more about economics than I do. Mm. Uh, it's, um, it's one thing to talk about economics based on, you know, concrete archaeological materials at hand. And it is quite a different thing uh, to, to write about economics from a perspective that involves economic theories. Mm. Um, I hope somebody else, uh, once they read my book, my, my forthcoming book, will be able to, um, to apply some interesting theories to uh, the data there. But uh, I don't feel comfortable uh, okay. even trying. I'm, I'm sure you will stimulate further work. What, can you tell us more about this, uh, this forthcoming book on, on economics? Well, I, um, uh, you know, it's going to be um, a counterpart or a sequel, you might say, to the, um, to the Chinese society in the age of Confucius book in the sense that it is, um, it is, it deals with the same period. And it is once again, uh, in some ways, an excuse to, um, to go through um, the archaeological record of this period, see what is new and exciting, um, remind people of some of the equally exciting things that were there before but, but mm -hmm. hadn't really been noticed, but there's a lot that is very new and very exciting that, you know, just needs to be brought to the extension of, uh, to the attention of, uh, of that part of the public that doesn't read Chinese. Mm -hmm. And, um, I'm also bringing in some of the Japanese scholarship um, on the subject, which um, which is extremely fine and which doesn't tend to get noticed outside of Japan. Mm -hmm. um, and so, again, I, I'm not making great um, uh, promises of um, uh, of uh, necessarily being uh, earth-shakingly creative here. It's a work of synthesis, mm -hmm. as the, pre uh, the previous one was. But the previous one was apparently found useful. So I hope that, that this one is going to be useful too. I write it for people like yourself, who, mm -hmm. who probably don't spend most of their time looking at archaeological report, but who would, in theory, if it could be done effortlessly, like to be told, you know, why those archaeological reports are um, worth going through or, uh, uh, you know, tell us something that we need to know. So that's, that's the kind of mediating role I am taking here. And then, of course, there's much more to be done, uh, which I don't think I need to do or should do because I'm probably not equipped to it. For it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, about, about this, uh, this sort of thing, about eliciting the... Uh, the, the voices, as it were, uh, behind objects. I, I want to read a couple of sentences here from also from uh, your Age of Confucius book, uh, where, where you, you teach us how to read something in a very subtle way. Uh, and this is after, of course, bringing forth lots and lots of material evidence about, about rituals and sacrifices and burials and so on. You then say, uh, you're summarizing the way that the inscriptions in the late Western Joe are written, and you say, the contrast is thus salient. What had happened? Evidently, the focus of ritual had shifted from the ancestral spirits to the living ritual community. Even though the ancestors were still the nominal focus of the sacrifice, they were no longer considered potential givers of supernatural aid and so on. You know, this, this requires a lot of subtlety in looking at an inscription which might for 90% of its wording echo inscriptions that had that other previous focus on the ancestors as givers of aid. But this, uh, you know, to be able to pick up the, the self-reflexive nature of, of those inscriptions and also to correlate it with the uh, epochs of, of ritual reform and what must have been debates about what was legitimate expenditure on rituals and on sacrifices, what was the purpose of, of ritual behavior and so on. I just think it's, it's wonderfully tuned, if I can use the, 
you know, the musical metaphor, you you just are capturing vibrations in those old inscriptions that are not at all obvious, even to people who deal every day, day in and day out with texts. Well, that's because I don't deal uh, every day, day in and day out with texts, but I look at a great number of them. Mm. Uh, I take, in that sense, a um, an anthropological approach in looking for patterns. I don't pretend to understand every word, word in these inscriptions. I am much more interested in their structure. The, the philological details um, are often... Um, you know, unimportant when you try to figure out what is most basic to these. And, you know, the details can then be uh, be scrutinized by, uh, by people who really know how to study ancient Chinese scripts. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it also helps to place these um, inscriptions, all of them, as a, as a universe of data, mm -hmm. not just as individual inscriptions. I think that makes a difference. But, but then this sub-universe of data in an even larger universe of data that, um, that includes the objects on which the inscriptions are placed and, uh, and their functional contexts. And, uh, and if you look at these in, uh, from an archaeological pers uh, perspective, and you, you cannot, if you do that, you cannot fail to notice that some things change over time and that there's a fairly significant change um, happening during the period um, about which I write in the passage that you just uh, just so kindly um, quoted. Um, so um, anybody could do this, mm -hmm. but of course some people aren't necessarily, you know, putting their focus, their intellectual focus on finding out these kinds of relationships. And I'm not blaming them. I mean, they, they, they find out other interesting things. Yeah, well, the saying goes that chance favors the prepared mind and <laughs> by, you know, by looking around, by reading around, by paying a lot of attention to a lot of uh, facts, you, you make that prepared mind. Mm. Yeah. So I'm wondering, we've, we've been talking for about an hour now, yeah. and um, perhaps we can open up for questions from the audience. What do you think, Lothar? Great idea. All right. Thank you. You you are uh, you are like Casey Jung in that you are very good at asking questions. Oh well, I I don't work for the CIA, so I don't do it as a <laughs> as an interrogation, but just to satisfy my curiosity, and maybe that of others. I prefer the other, I prefer the other CIA, the Culinary Institute of America. Yeah, we <laughs> we all prefer that one. <laughs> And I wonder how many wrong calls they get on the phone. I think they are asking for it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Do we hear from the audience? Okay, there's one question. Oh, it's a it's quite a long one. I can let you you want to kind of read that? Sure. Out loud? Send it up to us so we can see it. Okay, it's in the Q and A box. I am Jin Zemi, a sophomore at College of the Holy Cross in Worcester, Massachusetts. I have a question about your 1994 book on chime bells in Pretian China. I speculate that true shamanistic rituals incorporated the poetic qualities as well as mythological and religious beliefs of Chu Zi into the lyrics of chime bell song. Uh, when coupled with the hypothesis that true spoken vernacular reflected non sinitic substrates, I wondered if chime bell songs in the true state differed from those in other states phonology wise. Was there any previous research into Chinese ethnomusicology that linked Baxter Sagard reconstruction of old Chinese with archaeological evidence in the Yangtze Valley? What would you suggest I do if I proceed with my research at a doctoral level? Wow, that's um, that's a very specialized question. Um, uh, Horn, would you have any comments about um, the uh, the ideas concerning the the songs of true that are being voiced here? Uh, by um, the we, we don't have a lot of direct evidence. There, there is one song that was transcribed into Han period characters, I think. Um, 
And perhaps that would provide some guidance. And of course, you know, anyone can recognize that the, the rhythms and caesuras of Chu poetry are different from what you get in the North, but I, 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 don't, I don't quite know about the relation to the bells. When, when bell inscriptions do self-description, you know, when they commend themselves for their, for their sound and their, their copious echoing and so on, uh, you often find a lot of ung, ung, ung sort of sounds in the rhymes that I view as a kind of an attempt to make the language echo the properties of the bell. So one question that could be pretty easily solved by just looking up the, the verse would be to see how often are these ung, ung, ung sort of verses in, in Chu poetry. And if they're less rare, maybe the relation between music and song is uh, not meant to be one of uh, similarity, but of difference. But that's you know, really just skating on very thin ice of hypothesis there. Yes. I'm thinking too, it's, it's very hard to figure out what is truly distinctive about true, because for all the things that, that seem at first sight to be distinctive about true, we don't have any direct non-true counterparts. For instance, the Chuzi poems are the only Warring States period lyric poetry that we have from China. The, the Shijing poets, poems to which they are often compared are from an earlier period. Mm -hmm. So when comparing the two, you are comparing apples and oranges. You cannot um, prove that this, the same kind of poetry that we now have only for the Chuzi from the Boring States period, wasn't also being uh, composed in North China during the same period, and we just don't have anything left of it. Uh, and Mutatis Mutandi is the same with, with shooting like poetry in South China in the earlier periods. In fact, there the bronze inscriptions show that at least some people were putting together, uh, you know, four by four re uh, rhyme, uh, rhyme uh, metric poetry similar to um, to um, to the shooting poems, mm -hmm. but but that might just have been uh, their use of a more generalized um, religious idiom that was specific to the bronze inscriptions. I don't want to preempt this discussion, but in the material culture too, you know, we we learn about all this exuberant lacquer-based art from Chu. Sure enough, it exists. There it is. It's extremely impressive. But Laka doesn't preserve in North China. We don't have any of it. We don't. We know that they made it. We sometimes see little flecks of it in the in the ground when we excavate carefully enough in North China. It goes back to even earlier periods. There, even the Shang period, we, we see lacquer traces. But there isn't enough of it to to tell us what these things really looked like. They might have looked exactly the same as the ones from the true area. There's no way of telling. So, um, in my opinion. Uh, or we we are ill advised to um, to overemphasize the um, the uh, alleged differences between Chu and other parts of Zhou China, and that is certainly true of the, the ritual music too. I don't uh, I don't see anything where we can say with confidence that there is a contrast. Mm -hmm. As the languages go, we also have no idea what kind of language the um, the um, original population of the Middle Yangtze um, region was speaking or, and whether it was a non-Semitic language. On, the only thing uh, that we do know is that by the time anybody wrote anything down, it was in classical Chinese and, you know, not very different as things go from the classical Chinese that was written down anywhere else. Mm. Um, when it comes to correlating um, uh, dialects and material culture. Um, the only relevant work that I am aware of has been done not with musical instruments, but with um, the already mentioned glazed stoneware or um, proto porcelain, which can be uh, typologized in such a way that there are, in some, some people's opinion, there are seven regional complexes. Uh, there's another reconstruction that is only six. In any case, these two interestingly seem to correlate with dialect areas in modern China. And some people have speculated that these modern dialect areas 
were not originally dialects, but in fact, non-Sinitic languages that uh, took up, uh, took on so much of Sinitic vocabulary that they ended up becoming like local versions of Chinese. Although, frankly speaking, those of us who only know Mandarin don't understand those local uh, versions at all. Mm -hmm. In any case, you know, their, their geographic patterning seems to have been similar uh, or seems to be similar today to that of um, uh, of uh, stoneware, glazed stoneware, uh, in um, in the period between approximately a thousand BC and two hundred BC. This could, of course, also be quite completely accidental. Um, you know. Um, using a certain kind of glazed stoneware doesn't uh, prove that you speak a certain language and you can't really uh, draw a clear connection between this between the two yeah there are, there are always so many mysterious filters operating on the data that we have aren't there yes that that is true yeah. here comes a second question uh, here's one from giorgio bucciolati ah giorgio. Uh, who uh, talks about your scholarly personality echoing the, what the Katzen Institute has made possible for us over the years. I, I share that view. Um, a question that rests on our, says Giorgio, uh, respective personal experience in the field. I work as a foreigner in Syria as you work as a foreigner in China. And at the same time, we both have become very much identified with the local people. How do you view your foreignness at the very time that you become so closely integrated in many ways with the local culture? Well, I mean, when, when somebody uh, like myself who uh, looks the way I do and speaks Chinese the way I do, which is, you know, fluently, but certainly not perfectly, uh, goes to China, he or she cannot escape their foreignness. That is an irreducible, aspect of what we all do there. Um, the wonderful thing about working in China is that people are so nice to us. Mm. In fact, probably much nicer than we deserve some of the time. Certainly much nicer. <laughs> um, I, I'm glad you agree, Hon. Um, so, um, so I have been um, uh, I've been very blessed in having had wonderful collaborators. Um, and students and um, visiting scholars uh, who have taught me a great deal there. And of course, part of my um, role here is to read their work and try to um, mediate um, the very important work that is being done in Chinese archaeology to the international audience that um, for various reasons hasn't learned Chinese yet. So um, uh, here, uh, that, that's my responsibility. Now, of course, Syria and China are different in one respect. And that is that um, as a former colony, uh, the tenor of Syrian archaeology has been formed um, mainly by outside actors. And this is absolutely not the case in China, where from the very beginning, archaeology has been in the hands of um, Chinese scholars. The, the relevant literature is virtually completely in Chinese. Um, there is a strong archaeological community there. We are only sort of hangers on. We are in, in many senses guests, very privileged guests, but certainly not nothing more than that. And uh, all of our work has to, if it is to be taken seriously, has to take place within the discourse that is, un, uh, uh, is um, uh, irreducibly set by our Chinese colleagues. Um, and that's a good thing. In fact, there's so much talk these days about the decolonization of archaeology. And we, we had a long discussions about that during our recent institutional retreat at the Kotzen. 
And um, I was tempted at the time to say, and in fact, I did say during the breakout session, that you know everybody should look at Chinese archaeology as the model of what archaeological practice all over the world should be. The um, the relatively subordinate role taken by outside actors, the um, the leading role obviously taken by our Chinese. Um, um, collaborators, the presence of a very strong uh, administrative framework for the practice of archaeology that is linked to the Chinese state structure and which has worked reasonably well um, for the last more than 50 years. So, um, well, more than 60 years, in fact, at this point. So, um, all of these, um, all of these factors uh, are something that we in China more or less take for granted. And in fact, they take some getting used to. Uh, however, uh, it is something that of course, it, don't, it, it doesn't exist in many other parts of the world and arguably probably should. So um, I hope um, those of us at the codes who don't work in China can sort of look to China and um, maybe um, uh, bring Chinese practices into whatever fieldwork they do, wherever it is that they go, be it Ethiopia or Peru or Mexico or such other places. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, in Peru, especially in Peru and in Mexico, um, uh, uh, great strides have been made in recent decades to, um, to bring about an archaeological dis discourse that is no longer completely determined by what North American archaeologists happen to find interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and that needs to be strengthened. And we should play our role in strengthening that. We should not try to sort of um, go against that, to the contrary. And in that sense, I think the kind of work that Li Min and I and many of our students and, uh, and colleagues in this country are doing in China can at least be not necessarily a role model, but at least an example of how things can function and how things can be handled in a way that is more equitable, more just, and for those who participated also much more pleasurable. Right, yeah. And I, I'll take the opportunity to underline your work in translating the work of Chinese colleagues and presenting yes. it in, uh, not only Chinese, but also Japanese colleagues, you know, very, very important thing for us all to do, who have the, the facility in another language to... Thank uh, you for pointing this out. I do think this is extremely important. And in, talking about academic departments, they should, uh, you know, value that more. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've never had a problem with that, but I know some other people have. Uh, it is a trans doing scholarly translation is not something that professional translators can usually do. And it is something that takes just as much effort as writing scholarly monographs. Um, and, and should very happy that the first work. volume of, of my translation, well, the, no, I should say my translation of the first volume of Li Ling's book about the true uh, silk manuscript has just come out. Um, in Hong Kong. Gongsi, Gongsi. And the second volume, which is not translated by me, is uh, is being eagerly accept, uh, uh, expected. Good. But that that book I, uh, should hopefully make a, a major impact uh, on this particular subfield of early China studies. Great. Um, here we have a question that I think uh, you've already touched on a bit, but I'll bring it forth. Uh, one of our audience members says, I wonder if you could elaborate a bit more on the topic what can Chinese archaeology contribute to the world? Chinese archaeology can, uh, can uh, contribute to the world a great deal of um, uh, putting other cultures in perspective. Mm. We can, uh, we can, you know, we have been sort of conditioned to take as the norm what happened in the after all rather limited geographical area that encompasses the ancient Near East and the Mediterranean world. And then with, with appendages elsewhere in Europe and possibly parts of Africa. Uh, well, you know, once you come to China, you do see some parallels, but you also see overwhelming differences. And uh, also leading to extremely advanced um, uh, patterns of, uh, of um, social and political and cultural complexity and fantastic, of course, visual arts. So um, 
we have a genuine alternative here that um, we can, we as uh, archaeologists, can extend very far back into the past. We can, in fact, prove that it, they um, developed locally, that they, that, that of course they were linked uh, in some um, ephemeral ways to uh, developments elsewhere in the ancient world, but they were not determined by them. To the contrary, they may have exerted some influence on happenings elsewhere. And um, that, um, that really reverberate uh, throughout the centuries, uh, all the way until today. That is a lot for Chinese archaeology to contribute to the world. Well, and of course, then, uh, then there are all these, uh, these individual things that archaeology can, uh, that Chinese archaeology can, um, can um, contribute to um, uh, world archaeology. It, it, Chinese archaeology has essentially um, something to offer to every field of archaeology, and usually something that is unexpected and extremely relevant, mm -hmm. starting from uh, you know, early hominins all the way to, um, in fact, uh, industrial archaeology in uh, in the 20th century. Mm. Uh, Yimin raises one interesting uh, question, uh, something that you and I share, uh, which is that we were we were entering graduate school at the moment that people whose education had been delayed by 10 years on account of the Cultural Revolution were also going to graduate school. And for me, it was an immense privilege to sit on the same bench with these people who had been through a lot of hardship and who were not uh, going into graduate school because they didn't know what else to do with their lives, which was often the case with my American contemporaries, but who were, who were just you know burning with that famous hard gem-like flame and who, who just had life experience that we couldn't possibly match. Um, I'm wondering uh, about, about that as a specific ingredient of our, of our training and yeah. um, whether, to pick up Lehman's question again, uh, if you were, say, 20 years old again today with the magic spell, uh, what you would do differently if you were coming onto the scene now as a naive 20-year-old? Well, I don't think I would have a choice. You know, uh, by the way, you are absolutely right. Uh, these, uh, these much older fellow students uh, whom I had first at Peking University and then at Harvard were among my very major influences on, on my life. Um, too many to enumerate right now. Um, I hope they themselves know that. I mean, extraordinary, simply yeah. extraordinary. Um, but um, to answer your question, I wouldn't have a choice. Uh, you know, there isn't a question of not doing field work anymore. Of course, I would be doing field work, and uh, probably uh, would have to deal with, you know, trying to um, make sure that I can actually use the data in my dissertation and so on and so forth. So there's a whole new set of uh, of issues that uh, that I would have to do differently from. Uh, what I uh, I did at the time, I probably wouldn't be able to spend as much time as I did at the time, um, you know, sitting around and learning how to read bronze inscriptions. I might simply not be able to um, to get as far with classical Chinese as I, um, in fact, was fortunate to do. Um, I might not feel it possible to spend time not only in China, but also in Japan and um, integrate myself to some extent at least in the sinological sphere of that extraordinary place. Um, so um, a 20 years old in, uh, in the modern world has very different, um, uh, very different opportunities, but also very different expectations and also different limitations on what they could do. Um, they would also, of course, encounter a new, a, a different generation of teachers. Mm. That is not to be underestimated, who might teach them very different things. Um, certainly no less good, no less intelligent, no less intellectually fervent but uh, probably more specialized, far more specialized, mm -hmm. 
Um, so uh, developing the kind of um, um, encompassing perspective on at least a certain part of the field of Chinese archaeology that I have been able to develop would be much more difficult for a young scholar today, simply because of the pressure to um, to um, uh, to uh, contribute to certain very specialized topics. Mm. Um, if um, what I what would I do that I didn't do then and um, should have done when I was twenty? Well, I would have tried harder to get. Um, a good foundation in the natural sciences that was not part of my so-so German education, unfortunately. And I've, uh, I have come to um, find that lack sometimes an to be an impediment. Um, I would um, certainly, if I if I were alive today, I would. Uh, if I were twenty uh, today. Still alive, thank God. I you're alive today. Uh, but if I went by 20, I would, I would already be a computer wizard, no doubt, and I would be much stronger, stronger, and would make much, much more efforts to to um, integrate the the digital opportunities. As it is, I'm probably not not as strong in this respect as I probably should be, even for somebody uh, who is of my generation, and I'm still working on that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, I find it difficult. Um, but uh, that's that's another thing that if I was uh, 20 years ago, I would make sure to get under my belt. Mm -hmm. um, and if I could go back to 19 to the 1970s, I would probably do a great deal more traveling uh, than uh, at a young age than I've actually done. I mean, I'm, I'm reasonably well traveled in China and Japan and Korea, to some extent, South Korea, to some extent, but I haven't seen many of the other um, uh, areas where early cultures developed or when, uh, to the extent that I've been there, it has only been fairly late and for relatively short trips. Uh, that's too bad in a world where actually it is possible to go to those places. Mm -hmm. And um, and I do regret that because uh, being my current age, it's not as easy to uh, to get away and spend the time necessary. And of course, that would give one a better informed comparative uh, perspective on ancient civilizations. I, mean, I wish I had been to Syria, for instance, talking about Syria. I wish I had been to Turkey, where well, I've been to Istanbul, but, but I've not been to the archaeologically truly relevant parts of Turkey. I've, I've never been to Egypt. I've never been to, um, to Iraq, where not very easy to go now. You know, I am old enough that I could have gone to Afghanistan and still seen what there was to be seen in Afghanistan. It is all destroyed now. Yeah, I've never been to Peru. I've been to Mexico, but only briefly and not with the amount of intensity, even though I've actually published about uh, Maya archaeology. So uh, so there's a, a great deal that if I were 20 now, I would probably just take off a year and um, or take off large chunks of time and do that. Mm. Well, this is why we have take that much money so, either. <laughs> so that they can live our dreams. <laughs> And um, a questioner, uh, Lume from China, wants to know more about the book and about the book of your interviews. And I'm afraid we were sort of talking around it rather than talking about it specifically. But maybe, uh, maybe you could say a bit about the circumstances of these different interviews being taken and what sorts of response they had when they came out in journals and so forth before. Well, that's that's really something that um, I mean about the response. That's something that uh, the editor Meng Fan Zhu, who found them important enough to compile it into a book, would probably be better placed to answer. Mm. Uh, the the situation where most of them took place was just sort of usually um, a, a student or a younger colleague approaching me, asking me to do an interview. Oh, in two cases, it was journalists as well coming to. Um, 
um, but public intellectuals, not, not ordinary journalists, coming to interview and asking me all kinds of questions about what I do and what my perspectives are. And, you know, from, from this dialogue that we have had today, you can more or less imagine, you know, how it was. And, you know, I talked about various things in a rather loose fashion. There's a lot of overlap, I think, between the interview or the views, although I think um, Dr. Meng has done something to, to, uh, um, to do away with some of that. Um, then we added to that an interview that I had once given to a German journalist, where he talked to me about you know living in California as a German and why you know had had I immigrated here and uh, and so I made some rather rather frank remarks about that and uh, if if somebody wants to read about why I think the the uh, American university system is really one of the true uh, reasons um, uh, why one should be proud to be in America today. Um, even today, um, uh, they can read that interview. Um, anyway, so um, so there are these various um, public pronouncements that were published, most, most of them in China, and they have been expertly edited by Dr. Meng, who is um, a very fine um, scholar of uh, Chinese history and um, and writes in a beautiful style. And um, I've been very honored by his request to compile them in this fashion, even though I wasn't completely sure that they were worth it. They, he, he essentially convinced me to do it. And of course, the, the publisher um, made a great deal of effort um, on behalf of this book. And they produced uh, a beautiful uh, little volume. And uh, it is part of... Um, of course, one responsibility that we all have as professors in the ivory tower and that we can't always really do justice to, that is to, you know, talk to some extent to the general public. Well, in this case, it wasn't always the general public, it was in some cases, you might call it the general public, and about half the case it, it was, uh, cases it was to still students who were part of the archaeological scene. But, um, the way it has now been made accessible, it could certainly be read by people who aren't necessarily themselves archaeologists and who can understand or can, can at least um, sort of get some idea from this book about uh, why Chinese archaeology is so important and so exciting for somebody who isn't originally from China and who um, who wishes to sort of understand how this can all um, um, fit into a broader context. Yeah. And Here, we're lucky are with, the, with the question, shall we tell you? Yeah, but we're lucky that, the, uh, that there's such a large public of interested people in China who are conversant enough with disciplines like archaeology and textual studies to want to read a book of interviews by well, indeed, and this is something Lehman recently brought up too, right? I mean, there's a chi uh, in China right now, archaeology is uh, is enjoying um, the favors of the highest authorities, and so this this is potentially certainly a um, um, a very promising period in the history of the field. Um, it can be complicated, of course. Uh, okay. uh, and I think Lisa Rafel sends in a question that touches on the ways that it can be complicated. Uh, she says, how do we balance our regard for an investment in Chinese indigenous scholarly practices and their practitioners, in many cases, our close friends, colleagues, students, etc., with discomfort with other actions by the Chinese government in Xinjiang, Hong Kong, and elsewhere, that in many cases do not directly and immediately affect our work? We can look at extreme models of response. Perry Link and Roger Ames, for example. How do we respond with respect and compassion? Yeah, so Perry we, Link and Roger Ames, of course, are, to, uh, compared to an archaeologist, are in a privileged position because uh, the kind of work they can do, they can very easily do without going to China. Mm. Um, so um, they can sort of make pronouncements relatively um, you know, without immediate uh, consequences to at least 
the ability to do their scholarship um, uh, that, um, that make it impossible for them to go back to China. In, in my case, uh, that's not really an option, nor do I think it is in our particular field, uh, the, um, the thing that, uh, that would be most uh, constructive under the circumstances. Mm -hmm. Um, archaeology is fortunately one field, one subfield of Chinese studies where um, communication among scholars is functioning relatively well. And I think under the circumstances, especially given what is going on now, a priority must be placed on keeping the lines of communication open to the extent that this is possible and you know, welcoming visiting scholars, welcoming the students who come here for instruction. And, um, and uh, while not, of course, forgetting about the bigger issues um, that we all realize, and while not um, you know, being cavalier about them, nevertheless, um, in this case, um, concentrating on what specifically uh, we can do in our fields to, um, to um, uh, bring about a certain degree of normalcy in, in this uh, currently rather fraught uh, relationship. So um, in whatever goes beyond that um, probably um, becomes a case of um, you know, do I um, uh, do I want to leave the the um, confines of my expertise and engage in journalistic grandstanding about um, contemporary China? I'm not a specialist of contemporary China, although of course doing archaeology gives you a certain ex um, perspective on contemporary China. I have chosen to. Um, use my expertise to, um, to work on the Committee on Cul uh, of uh, Cultural Property Protection to make sure that at least, you know, um, the illegal trade in antiquities um, between China and, um, and other parts of, uh, of the world gets curbed to the extent that we can do it within our legal framework here in the US. So, um, that the service on that committee has given me some opportunities to speak out on these concrete issues about which I actually know something. Mm -hmm. About contemporary Chinese politics, I don't know more, and I, I probably know a great deal less than certain journalists. So um, to the extent that everybody being human should be concerned about these things, I certainly should be concerned and I am concerned. But to the extent of um, using one's uh, 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 professional platform to make uh, political uh, statements, I think I, I need to make sure that, uh, that whatever statements are, are made are within the confines of where I can be professionally useful. This is a very roundabout answer, and it's not satisfactory. And you know, sometimes one wished one could be um, less uh, um, circumspect, but um, but that's uh, the reality of being a China scholar at the moment. I don't know what what do you think. Me? Um, well, I'm I'm in more or less the same situation. Um, uh, well, no, I'm not entirely in the same situation. I'm more in the situation of people like Lincoln Ames, whose uh, whose access to Chinese texts is unimpeded. You know, yes. as, long as, as long as I have a, a good library and uh, an internet connection, I'm fine. Yes. But where, where, you know, where I'm often uh, concerned is with the close colleagues and collaborators who are, you know, who would uh, potentially be, you know, put at risk if I were to get very involved in certain things, I would always worry about that. Um, and that that would uh, result in cramping my style in certain ways, right? But sure. uh, I'm not in the position of, uh, say, one of the celebrities uh, a little bit north of UCLA, who 
who exist entirely in the mode of uh, theatrical self-representation and who basically have have no nothing to lose by you know being very vocal about things that don't directly concern them so it's 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 awfully complicated it's it's awfully complicated and and of course there should be a place in the world for those people i mean it's it's it, we, you know we, there need to be people who who talk in this way as part of the pluralistic concert of voices that we all you know are privileged to have around here um of course, uh, there's also the uh, an issue that we already alluded to at the beginning, namely the fact that the information flow out of China isn't always, you know, ideal, mm -hmm. and especially about actually very contemporary matters. And uh, one stands um, one stands reminded um, of that a great deal when one reads me media coverage of China. So that's another reason why those of us who still pretend to be academics uh, should be cautious in uh, making uh, pronouncements that, you know, while politically satisfying, may turn out to be not 100% factually correct in the end, mm. and which we cannot really go out and research into, because first of all, they are not our research purview, and secondly, we might not be able to get that information. But I would say that we also need to be cautious about being too cautious. <laughs> yes, that's true too. Yeah. That's, it's a balancing act. Yeah. But of course, then, then there are many things on which you know we we uh, we have opinions and probably should out uh, should speak out, and one has to pick one's fights after the, uh, after a certain amount of time. Right. Um, another but thank you, Lisa, for asking this very pertinent yeah. questions. It's it's certainly one that that I have grappled with. Yeah, uh, Lai Guolong writes, uh, hello, hello Guolong, how are you doing? Uh, writes uh, to ask if there are things that were edited out in the publication of the interviews. Anything significant that is missing that uh, your faithful readers would want to know about? It's a good question, you know. Um, uh, of course, to, the, to, to, cert, to a certain extent, oneself centers, one self censors. And, and sometimes certain formulations then somehow magically disappear. I mean, for instance, when, um, when I mentioned that I started to, um, to learn Chinese when the Cultural Revolution was going on in China, and that there were lots of Westerners at the time who were truly fascinated with the Cultural Revolution and learned Chinese, and some, some of them learned Chinese for that reason, um, I brought that up in, in one of the interviews, and I, I, th I think that didn't make it in. And I don't really know why, because I don't think this is politically sensitive at all, but apparently somebody thought so. Mm. Just bringing up the Cultural Revolution, of course, sometimes can, can send the wrong uh, message. But, but of course, I wasn't, uh, you know, criticizing, certainly criticizing anybody in China. I was, um, if anything, making a pron pronouncement on the people in Germany at the time who were probably, um, you know, too impressed with certain propagandistic writings that were coming out of China at the time. I wasn't one of them. I, that's certainly not why I took on the study of Chinese when I was in my teens. Um, I just, um, I, I, I had um, much more diffuse ideas of, of why I was interested in China. I was just fascinated with the place. Mm. Uh, another thing was, uh, that wasn't in an interview, that was in an article I published in, um, in English, which was then translated into, uh, into Chinese, in which I had um, mentioned um, somebody's excavation campaign in the 1950s. They did research, uh, re, um, um, salvage excavation in, uh, in part of the Huanghe River Valley that was supposed to be flooded due to a dam. And then the dam was, was never, the, the artificial lake was never filled because there had been some wrong calculation. I, I mentioned that fact. Um, uh, as a by and by, that was cut out. Apparently, that was that wasn't thought relevant or maybe politically sensitive. I mean, sometimes it's, it's surprising things that that get cut out, yeah. and um, yeah, and, and so various things of that nature. Yeah. 
well, you know, even even the operation of translation is always a bit of a distortion too. Right? Yes, uh, and of course, unlike unlike many people, you write directly in Chinese, so you you have only yourself to blame. <laughs> I uh, I am um, uh, you are, uh, you have a colleague at Chicago, Professor Shaughnessy, who really writes directly in Chinese and extremely well. Mm -hmm. uh, I I have written directly in Chinese, but. Um, I don't do it when I can avoid it because, first of all, it takes me forever and the result isn't really uh, all that great. It still needs editing. So um, I, um, I prefer writing in, in English, which at this point has become sort of my most comfortable uh, scholarly language and also happens to be the one that is most widely read. Right. Let's see. Well, I think... Um... I think we've pretty much used up our time, Lothar. We've, we've had generous contributions from our audience members. Uh, announcements have gone out about where to find the book, which is a good thing. Although uh, I, I hope that the, the, uh, the, the wild fever of, uh, of people rushing to purchase this book will not distract them from your other books, which are just as good, even if their covers are a little bit more boring. <laughs> This one doesn't exist in English, although they have, they have for some reason, printed at the, uh, at the beginning uh, the English version of some kind of a, a self-statement that I sent them, uh, which, is, um, which is also there in Chinese. So there is an English portion of that, but um, that's not why um, non-Chinese uh, readers would necessarily want to... Uh, to um, to um, buy the book. Um, 20 pages. Uh, I, will, I will deposit a copy in the UCLA library. Unfortunately, it hasn't been open recently, mm. so I've not been able to do that. So who, uh, if the librarian is, uh, is listening in, they don't need to buy it. I have <laughs> copies and copies. And I have there are two more uh, short questions on the screen. Do you think, Han, that we have... Uh, Let's that look we have them now. What, what is there? I thought uh, we'd... Han Moore has a question. Oh, uh, you know what? I didn't scroll down. Yeah. All right. Here's Han Moore. Yeah. All right. He says, I've been fascinated by your marching separately to attack jointly method. Right? What is it? Uh, not itu tonggui, but, you know, tongji, uh, right? Itu tongji, maybe. Uh, mean marschieren vereinschlagen. It's, it's actually <laughs> the general von Moltke who, who yeah. this. Right. I'm sure Suma Chien said it too at one point. It's surprisingly difficult to do, even when you are a general. No. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at least with pre-modern forms of communication. Now with, uh, with cell phones, of course, it's, a, it's yeah. no problem. So anyway, Hamo says, uh, would you someday try, or is it possible to apply both within a single work, either a monograph or a ch chapter of a book, to test how validly and efficiently this methodology works? Um, well, I've written one article, which is very difficult to find, except it, I've put it on academia.edu, so it's actually, if you, if you can get there, it's easy to find, where I've exemplified it, where I've simply looked at um, uh, bells and, um, and um, uh, bronze vessels and what the, the texts say about their specific combinations, their numerical combinations, how many mm -hmm. tripods in a set, how many bells uh, in a set. Mm -hmm. And then I have compared that to the archaeological record and I found that the texts are not wrong. The combinations they described did exist, but only at a certain social level during a certain period. So that's actually something you mentioned earlier. It is something that Confucius remembered in his time, although when Confucius was alive, the situation has become way more complicated than that. So um, it, it's one example of where, where we can, you know, um, finally strike jointly. Uh, but of course, it's in it's in, it's an extremely limited um, application of this method. Mm -hmm. I'm sure one could, you know, um, write an extremely long um, book on the economic history that would have 
uh, of China that would have archaeological chapters and textually based chapters. And it, I don't consider it impossible that there would there might be one scholar who develops these joint competencies and, uh, and writes this. Um, it might be better done, however, in the um, in the form of uh, of an edited publication with um, with various cognizant specialists spooling their their talent, or maybe uh, writing together something that uh, that then is published under several names. I think that would improve the quality. These days, you know, our skills are so limited and so specialized that um, great works of synthesis. I mean, even the, the one that I'm trying to write just from an archaeological perspective is are almost is are almost impossible to achieve. And then here's one from uh, Xiao Chen. Uh, how do you compare the style and completeness of record keeping in ancient China with other civilizations, especially, especially in, the in the area of technology and engineering when doing your research? Ah, oh, that's a very good question. Um, you know, I've not really studied the other civilizations in this re respect, and I would, I would um, suspect that they are all different from one another. In India, you would have absolutely nothing, and in the Maya area, you probably wouldn't have anything either. You would, you would have uh, written records, but not about uh, technology and engineering. Whereas in the case of um, of ancient Greece and Rome, you you do have some, and of course in the Chinese case you have some very interesting materials and also a long sequence of them strung together mm -hmm. in books that were added to through time. And then again you can you can apply archaeological methods mm -hmm. and see you know what of all of these things that are covered in these texts um, it, were actually practiced at at any given time. Um, so in the Chinese uh, context. Um, I think um, there is um, certainly a great deal of worthwhile material available. Um, and, uh, and I think that is also true uh, in some of the other old world civilizations, but not in all of them. Um, but the specifics uh, would differ very, um, uh, very um, uh, markedly uh, among them. That's what I can uh, immediately um, think of uh, in response to this particular question. Yeah. All right. Well, Li Mian, what do you say? Yes, I think we can uh, conclude with this wonderful note from Halley. Thank you, Lothar. It has been my honor to follow the successes of your students at UCLA. You have really inspired all of us. Thank you very much for this wonderful opportunity.